life is that my whole thing is we only have the present moment mm -hmm. to live in. But importantly, we're informed by our past. Our past is very important, but it depends on what we do with it. And some people may become stagnated and only hold on to the past. And therefore, they become frozen somewhat like Lot's wife. But in our present moment, we have to decide. So if we have some goal to reach toward, something hopefully spiritually or humanistically good, then in our present moment, we can learn from our past and move toward the future. Remember her turning her gaze to the floor, how she saw red when her husband said they were leaving, hearth and home, warm bread and salt, chores unfinished, dreams undone. Remember her reaching for sandals to traverse burning sand, and to bind back her hair a tight-fitting band. Remember, Remember her brushing against her daughter's skirts as they fled, rushing toward or away from what they saw through a veil of fear. Remember, Remember her escaping Sodom's streets, soon to be ashen and wailing for the two daughters left behind. Remember her following her husband, blinded by wind and sand and tears, tripping over hot stones, stumbling over the cast of long shadows. Remember, Remember her smelling the heat that pressed her legs and neck, and her hearing the crackling flesh, the screams of people she passed at the market the cries of babes who fed at her breast. Remember her touching their faces. Remember, Remember her turning like a child in the womb and walking in a dream through the rooms of her house, finding one room new to her there all along. Remember her glancing back to sing her redacted name to the city. Remember her freezing as she observed God's hand. Something within her crushed. Not a foot or an artery, but remember her holding her grandchild's doll, its broken leg, what she bound with twine before the angels came. Remember. and appreciative to our other partners, including the Christian Theological Seminary and uh, the JCC, uh, for partnering on the RSA program. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Lev Rothenberg uh, for helping us organize and host this event and exhibition 
here at the JCC. And there's lots of people to thank, and I know Sandy's going to thank some of the faculty. Uh, but I want to thank Sandy for her leadership in this program, and Callie Smith, uh, who's the new program manager for the Religion, Spirituality, and the Arts program. They've just done an amazing job this year, and we're looking forward to seeing what they do next year. So two quick announcements. There are a number of pieces of paper on your chair. One is your program, and inside your program towards the end, you will find an advertisement for an event on April 3rd featuring the cellist Maya Beiser. This is part of this year's RSA programming. I encourage you to come. It's free. It's here at the JCC, 7 p.m. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. You've got to come to this event. And secondly, uh, there is a little flyer about the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute. You can take notes on the back of that if you like. And then the JCC has a, a, given you a pencil and a review form. If you could fill that out at the end of the evening's event, it's really helpful to them. But I want you to keep in mind that we at the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute are going to follow up with an email to you tomorrow also asking you to fill out an evaluation form. This is a different evaluation form. This is an evaluation form for our funders who funded this program, uh, who is the, which is the last group of people I want to thank, and that's Lily Endowment for their support of the Religion, Spirituality, and Arts program. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Sandy Sasso up on the stage. Well, you didn't know you'd have so much work to do following this program, but we are so very delighted that you are here. Uh, a culmination of a year's work uh, with a group of 12 artists. Uh, so the Religion, Spirituality, and Arts Initiative actually began in 2013, and it began at Butler University. Uh, and we've had about seven exhibitions, and we are delighted to now be at IUPUI uh, at, with the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute. And I want to thank Jason Kelly. I mean, he's been just absolutely wonderful in shepherding this program and bringing it to a new level and hoping for even greater expansion. So as I was walking um, in the hall, as you were looking at the art, some people said, Who's Lot's wife? What's this story? So for those of you who may have forgotten what you once knew uh, from Sunday school, uh, a very brief summary. You will actually hear the story of Lot's right, life, wife in one of the poems. But So you know that Lot, uh, his wife, and his family lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was considered a very evil town. We have assumed in present day that they were evil because they practiced homosexuality. That is not the original story. That didn't happen till the fourth century. Yeah, early on, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality. And because they so hated strangers, uh, God, as the Genesis story tells us, decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah completely. But um, with the help of Abraham arguing not to destroy the whole cities, ultimately Lot, his wife, and family are told that they can leave. Um, two daughters do not leave. Two daughters leave with Lot and his wife, and there is only one commandment, they should not turn back. And so they leave the city, and uh, as they are, and they hear the thunder, lightning, the cataclysm, Lot's wife turns back, and she, as the story tells us, becomes a pillar of salt. That is what we know, but that is not what these artists are sharing with us. So we had this amazing opportunity to bring together 12 artists, visual artists, musicians, uh, poets, to come together to look at the story of Lot's wife through the eyes of religious interpretation, uh, visual art, poetry, literature, and music. 
And after having studied for a period of weeks, they began to explore what this story might mean to them. You see that on the walls, and you will hear that in the performance and the reading of the poetry today. I don't think you will ever look at the story of Lot's wife again the same way. And if you've never read the story, you're probably going to go look at what it originally said. So uh, this has been an extraordinary experience for me. It's been transformative for me, as I know it has been for the artists. A lot um, of people have made this possible. I want to just thank, once again, the Lilly Endowment for their generous grant to make this possible. The Jewish Community Center has been an incredible host. We have met here for eight sessions for two and a half hours in an evening, and they've enabled us to use this beautiful space for our exhibit. Uh, Lev Rothenberg and Kelsey Eberly have been really incredible to work with. I also want to personally thank Callie Smith, who has really made it much easier for this program to exist and comes up with incredible ideas, and it's really wonderful. Uh, Callie was an artist in our first seminar, so this is terrific for us. Uh, Dan Cooper, who you see taking pictures everywhere and video, uh, videoing, uh, was the curator of the exhibit and videos every class and sort of keeps a historical record of our conversations and the art that we have produced. We have had an amazing group of faculty, and I, I would ask the faculty to rise. Uh, Julia Mooney Moore, Shari Wagner, Stephen Stolen, and Joseph Tucker Edmonds. <laughs> Understand the faculty don't just come one time. They come for the sessions, and they really become part of our seminar, and I, I've learned so much. It's been wonderful. So I would uh, first like to ask all the artists in this seminar, whose names, I'm going to read all the names, they're in the program, all the artists from this seminar to please stand so people can recognize you and thank you for the work you've done. <laughs> and don't sit down. I want to also ask previous artists to join in standing so we can see how many people have been part of religion, spirituality, and the arts. If you know artists, or you or yourself, you can sit down now. If you know artists, <laughs> uh, or you yourself are an artist and have not participated in the class, we would love for you to apply. Uh, there's information in the back of the pamphlet for how to uh, go through the application process. I'm happy to answer, as is Callie, any questions you have about the program. Uh, we also encourage you, once again, April 3rd, 7 o'clock, Maya Beiser. What's so extraordinary is that she wrote a cello opera on Lot's wife. And it really is incredibly powerful. We're not putting on the whole opera. We didn't have $50,000. But we are enabled to hear this incredible artist play the cello and pieces of the work of that opera. And we're going to have a conversation with her. So we are delighted uh, that you are here. And I am just going to give directions to the performers. Um, Catherine Simmons is going to come up first to do her poetry. And then I'm not introducing anybody else up. So I'm Sandy Sasso, which I think I forgot to tell you, <laughs> the director of the program. And then each artist will follow the other. And I know you're in for a special treat. Thank you so much for coming. my brother John Simmons who's going to help me read the poem. He's going to read the text of Genesis and I'm going to read the words of Lot's wife Edith. But before we begin I just want to make a couple of quick notes about the poem to help you understand it. Um, it is in the form of a lament. 
A lament is both a poem of sorrow and a prayer. Uh, laments occur in the Bible, in the Book of Lamentations, and in the Book of Psalms, and in some of the prophets. And scholars have said that typically a lament would include each of these elements, an invocation of God, uh, venting of distress and complaint, petition to God for help, um, expressions of trust in God, and expressions of praise of God. And you might ask, why praise? And the answer is that that is a way the speaker is expressing trust that God is good and God will act to resolve the crisis. Uh, the second point I want to note about the poem is it's in the form of an alphabetic acrostic, which means that each stanza starts with and emphasizes a letter of the alphabet sequentially. The Book of Lamentations in the Bible is actually also an alphabetic acrostic. However, you would have to read Hebrew in order to see that. And my poem is in English, so you could easily see uh, the letters. Uh, again, scholars tell us <clears throat> that the point of the alphabetic acrostic is to emphasize the totality of destruction, A to Z, and at the same time to show that there is order being imposed on the chaos, and that is to create a sense of hope. So as we read this, listen for the letters of the alphabet in each stanza. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Awake, God of my ancestors. Advise Edith. Answer me, God of our family home. I am afraid. Broken brooms now lie scattered with bones of dead kin. Beams above me are cracking. Blood stains my floor. Cabbage and challah I gave our guests cooked on my hearth burnt corpses I received in response, carnage of children. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look. I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Donkeys bray all night, hounded by death and dust. Dogs yelp and snarl in the dark. Demons slink about. Earth collapses and life shrivels, evil thrives. The evening star is shrouded in grit. Enemies crouch near. Firstborn daughter, you must flee the furious horde. Foreigners have provoked fear among us. Fires blaze. But they replied, stand back. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near the door to break it down. But the men inside reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they were unable to find the door. Gardens of the Jordan Plain, barren as graveyards. Gone are the times of gathering grain. Our grass is dead. Holy one, you trample hope, harrow it. Have you turned from Abraham's clan, hidden your face? Infants in empty homes lie dead, Edith faints. Innocent children are crushed to the ground, Edith crumbles. Jars of red wine fall on stone. Jays fly to the hills, jackals howl. 
Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Kindle in us the flame of contrition. Hear our keening plea. Kiss us with the kiss of peace, O keeper of homes. Like cranes in the evening sky lit by the sun, like lavender in the field is our God, lovely to behold. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-laws to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. Mourning will cease when Yahweh acts. Misery will abate. Malignant hatred will be overcome, the mob stilled. No one is a stranger to you, native or alien. We are like nestlings with open mouths, nourished by you. Only the living can esteem you, omnipotent God. Oblations will not flow from a corpse, only rot. But Lot lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, or else you will be consumed." Pitched into chaos by the cataclysm, your people panic. Perplexed without your succor, the sodomites perish. Quell this cruel firestorm, O Lord, quench your wrath. Quiet the suckling's screams, O quicken us. Remember how you saved us before from ruin and hunger. Raging drought killed our sheep, yet you revived us. And Lot said to them, O no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot flee to the hills, for fear the disaster will overtake me and I die. Look, that city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Very well, I grant you this favor too, and will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore, the city was called Zor. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Save me, God, for brine and sulfur sting me. I will sacrifice my own supple flesh as penance, a ransom of salt. Tearful and dauntless, I stop. I turn back. Taut and crusty, my astonished mouth. Torpid, my thick limbs. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Understand what I am choosing, unhinged by grief. I bear witness to creation's upheaval, the undoing of all. Void is the vast, harsh desert. Vowing to remain, I stand vigil, voiceless, a dove of peace. Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and saw the smoke of the land going up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that... When God destroyed the cities of the plain, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had settled. Witness to God's bitter judgment, I am the warning. The wicked will remember Sodom, I the sentinel watch. Exculpate Adit, O God of mercy, examine me. Never was I a xenophobe, exonerate me. Yoked to sin, the sodomites spurned strangers. Yahweh slew them. Years of oozing their hatred yielded but death. A zenith sun, dazzling and fierce, I blaze under azure sky. Zealous to instruct the living, 
I persevere, Zor's Sentry. The song is to assist you in engaging the display entitled Lot Agonistes. It's an opera libretto retrieved from the future and is a little tricky to navigate. There are instructions posted at the display to also be of service. The piece is recitative. In opera, this style is used to forward the story without using dialogue. It generally contains more information than music which is the case with this piece as well. Most modern operas do not use recitative as it sounds very old fashioned. In the future, being in fashion will not be as important as by then they will pretty much have seen it all. There is music to accompany the reading of Lottegonistes that can be played on the CD player located on the display table. It was recorded on a harpsichord, as was the custom in the 17th and 18th centuries. One might think of similarities with modern rap music as the words have almost all of the significance and the music is only there obliquely to push along the rhythm. The poetic libretto is rather long for an event like this. So if you would like a copy to read at home leisurely, one will be sent free of charge via the contact email or card at the display. It will be in a Word file for your computer. Enjoy that technology now for in the future, all of this digital hoo-ha will be replaced with dancing. Singing, too, will have its place, as we can see with this Lord Agonistes display. Even recitative will be around. So nice to have you with us all. And now back to the Bach.
Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, give a bit of context to the poem I'm about to read. Um, the first evening that our seminar met happened to be the day of the televised Kavanaugh hearings. And um, Dr. Ford's testimony that day, um, her looking back, has stayed with me throughout our study of this story. Um, my poem is written as a message to Lot's wife. To you whose husband was Lot. Our first real encounter was in the evening of a day when another woman dared to look back. That day, Christine Blasey Ford became a pillar, eyes closed as if in prayer, right arm raised. She'd shed salty tears during her testimony. Yet the men prevailed. Is it her lot, too, to become a cautionary tale? Will we remember her name? I remember my young self trying to be adoring and still in my wordless role as Mary in a Christmas play, looking down on the plastic savior in my arms. Later, how disappointing to learn that even he would use your story as a warning. I tried to find my place in the religion of our fathers, where girls are measured like the hems of their skirts. I was born with original sin and the shame of wanting more. Perhaps I threw that baby out with the bathwater, but I found no role for me in the stories where women like you are cast, the victim or vamp, bit parts in someone else's drama. I'm writing my own story now. Shall I write one for you? Tell me your name. Hi. Um, I wrote three um, contemporary American sonnets um, that were actually inspired by the words of St. Augustine um, in response to the Old Testament story of Lot's wife when he said, don't turn back when you're being saved, which I thought was good advice. The refugee. The way was long and hard, hot and dry, and I yearned for Angua to slake the thirst and wet my cracked lips that stuck together, soothe the roof of my mouth that was veined like thin parchment. Caravan connotes a train of vehicles, some transport other than grimy feet, caked with dust and mud and throbbing so heavily that I could hear the plodding of each footfall in my ears as I trudged forward. Yet the caravan of which so many expressed fear was just the mass of us, refugees from faraway places where danger lurks in every doorway, where drugs are the currency in which our children must trade. We could not turn back, no matter the threat, for a last breath behind us was most certain, then whispered death ahead. The trafficked. 
I was lost and then you found me, shivering in a pool of storm water, drenched with both rain and cold sweat. You pointed the way and I held back, frozen with fear and the wetness that engulfed me. You spoke kind words, you offered warmth, but I was torn, no longer knew how to sense trust. Where would you lead me? Would it be to safety or to place more treacherous than even before? Too tired to think, too scared to decide, imagery of home nudged me forward and let you take me by the hand, out of the puddles, away from the slime and the drudgery and the shame that had claimed me ever since I had been snatched against my will. Afraid, I knew enough still not to look back. The Addict. Once I was a rapturous child, innocent and free, and bemused by the world around me, where beetles and butterflies, crocuses and tall, lank blades of grass were my daily discoveries. Then I grew and became seduced by dimmer, darker pursuits that promised joys of a different nature. And I chased them all into a deep thicket where I found myself snagged, scratched, caught. Yet the hand of someone who loved me reached in among the brambles and beckoned. A firm voice, cautioning, called me to crawl away from temptation and to see me urges ensnaring me. The voice was loud and persistent and strong. As I inched forward, eyes raised to the sky, I followed this, my savior song. I'm William Peacock. Uh, I'm a composer, one of the participants in the uh, Religion, Spirituality, and the Arts Seminar. Um, and as you may have surmised, I've written music uh, to be a part of this. Um, in discussing the music, I'd like to start with a, a poem. It was one of the poems that we read while we were studying poetry about Lot's wife. Um, it's titled Sodom Gomorrah, and it's by Eliza Victoria, a lady from the Philippines. <clears throat> They found a pillar of salt outside the city limits, the shape neatly preserved, a woman caught in the gesture of longing. Those who found her at first wanted to sprinkle her on the burned earth, the trees charred beyond naming. Then they opted on practicality and rubbed her into the flesh of gutted fish, poured her into soup, placed her in crystal decanters on the tables of kings. All who tasted her wished to go back. Back where, they asked. Home, they whispered. No matter how dirty, no matter how black, no matter the many times the question was asked, how can you live here? But this is mine, they said. This foul place, this is mine. And they wept for the streets that no longer existed, the salt trickling down their cheeks. Um, and I really appreciated that being a part of the poems that we were studying. Um, before that time, I didn't have uh, much connection with Lot's wife in particular. Um, and it was really helpful because it created some, some empathy uh, for her. Um, from, uh, 
my own faith didn't cost me a, a tremendous amount. It, it's cost me, but it's been more like personal things. It hasn't been like I was disowned from my family and you know everything. You know, it's not like my whole life was destroyed. Um, it helped me to empathize with Lot's wife and to, and to understand how, when she is commanded, leave everything you've ever known, it's all going up in smoke, and follow your husband Lot and his strange God outside of the city into the unknown. Um, there's an understandability to her wanting to turn back to look uh, where she came from. Um, and that was one part of what really fed into creating this piece. The other part um, helped provide the title. We know Lot's wife uh, turned toward the city, um, and when she turned toward the city, she turned uh, from Lot and a strange god. Um, and uh, I really wanted to get a sense of the, the character of, of God, particularly his holiness. Um, and it's a bit like salt. Salt has a, a dual function. Um, a bit of salt is really good. It's flavorful. It um, can be used to preserve things. Uh, there's also qualities of salt where like, a, quite a lot of salt is really destructive. Um, if you've heard of uh, uh, armies destroying cities, they will sow the ground with salt to prevent anything from growing there ever again. Um, and so there's sort of a dual nature to it. Uh, and, and reading the story and, and trying to get it sort of Lot's wife's perspective, um, I really wanted to get at the sort of dual nature of God, the sense in which like God's holiness in, in one sense is described as very desirable and very good, and in another sense, um, God is destroying the city. Um, uh, so the p title of the piece is Whom Lot's Wife Turned From. Um, and I'm going to go ahead over there. Uh, and we're going to tune. Actually, let me introduce the performers because they are not written in your program. On clarinet, we have Patty Hoover. And on flute, we have Carly Group. Uh, Brittany Parker is playing cello. Angela Pulliam is playing violin. Abigail Houston is on piano. And Corey Denham is playing percussion. And we'll tune and then we'll begin.
I want to thank you all for coming. I um, hope that, can I ask all the artists just to come up here with the faculty on the stage so you can see them all and have a chance to thank them. I hope you will invite other people to see the exhibit. It is up here uh, till the end of April. I hope you all come back on um, April 3rd. And you know, whenever you add just a, come, come up on the stage, whenever you add just uh, a little bit of salt to your food, I hope you'll remember Lot's wife. <laughs> So if we can just all, uh, well, let's wait till everybody comes up. <laughs> there is one artist, unfortunately, who is in the hospital, but he, she will be with us on April 3rd. So her art work is up here as well. So let us thank everybody who made this evening possible. for coming.